finally get to this very fun topic. Not all braces are created equal. Okay? This idea that not all braces are exactly the same. Okay, last time in class we were drawing a diagram, a moment diagram, and it looked something like this. It had moment, it was a simply supported beam. Okay, and we were putting constant moment on both sides of the beam. And we had this scenario, this idealistic scenario that it would go up, it would go up, and then it would go over. So, it's so beautiful, so pure, but then it doesn't always work out that way. Okay. There's actually four possible cases, and please realize that these cases, I'm not, they're not drawn exactly right. They're, they're kind of in the ballpark. They're kind of just, you know, other things can happen. That's kind of the, the concept. And we had one of them that we called, um, I believe it was case four, and that was the one that actually behaved like we wanted it to. Okay? You could say that one actually went up, you know, and it, it's, it's going to come up and over and something like that, and that's what we call case four. Okay, and we say maybe it failed somewhere out there. Okay, and, and what was case four? Do you, does anyone remember? It's a plastic hinge formation, right? It's a true plastic hinge formation. And when that happens, we can truly use, um, we can truly use uh, uh, plastic design. What? What's plastic design? What's that all about? It's using an event to event analysis until you find the actual failure for your structure, right? Mm -hmm. And I, like I said last time, that's very useful for some agencies use it to try to try to promote themselves to say that they can make their beams smaller, right? Their columns smaller, things like that. Um, and it's also a great, great technique if you're looking at extreme events, okay? Like looking at bombs, you know, extreme natural hazards, things like that. Great, great thing, and you have to have plastic hinges in failure mode. Okay, great. And then we had another one that, that traced, it traced the same path, but then it failed about here. I called that three. We have another one that we call it two, and then we have another one we call one. Now, let's talk about the one for a second. Now, this is kind of sad. We don't even get to this M sub R value. What, what was M sub R? It was 70% of MY. Okay? 0.7 of MY. That's what M sub R is. 0.7 of my. We don't even get there. We don't even get to this 70% M sub R value. Okay, it just fails. And what, what were the modes that caused that failure? Well, it was elastic. There's actually three possible ones. And we're, and we're gonna, this is a trend that we're going to see over and over and over again. When we talk about buckling, as an undergraduate, you only really talked about lateral torsional buckling. We're going to talk about the three possible forms. There's, there's actually one more snail chart that we'll get to, but three possible forms that actually lead, lead to three different snail charts. Lateral torsional buckling. What was the other one? Local flange buckling and local web buckling. Okay? Okay? Talk about that coming up. But this, um, I guess this is a, this is a great, this is a great, um, segue and for every one of those we're actually going to have snail charts three different snail charts and the snail charts are going to look the same and that's why people sometimes mix them up that's why people sometimes don't realize that they're different and they're important to take keep keep track of okay but then there's the one we know and love the lateral torsional buckling right where this is L sub B and this is phi MN up here and then hey this looks exactly the same the shape is the same, everything's the same, except for the x-axis is totally different. What's, what's the x-axis, do, do you remember? Well, first we have to decide, is this, a, is this a local web or a local flange? Let's pick one. How about a flange? Sure, why not? Local flange buckling. And what does that look like when that happens? Curves what curves up? The flange does. The flange waves at you. Okay? The flange waves at you. Now you may see some bending in the web. Okay? 
because that web's going to try to restrain the flange, but you will see the flange wave. Okay? See how it's wavy? Come on, it's the land of the waving wheat. You should know this, right? Yes. Wavy, not straight. Local flange buckling. Okay? So what do we call, what's, what goes down here on the x-axis? Yeah, and what is that for the flange? Two times the thickness, because they, they do it a little strange. You're, you're right, Miles, you are right, dead on. And what they like to do it is, they like, B sub F is in the manual, and it is the total width of the flange. So they divide it by two, so they can get just one side of it. And then again, they divide by T, thickness of the flange, but you're right. You're exactly right. Okay? That's all they're doing. That's all they're doing here. And that's exactly what goes down here. Gamma of the flange. And then we have a gamma P and a gamma R. Okay? And those are tabulated um, in your steel manual. Okay? Where those are. I meant to bring my steel manual today. I'll, I'll try to bring it next time so, so, so we can actually look at that in the manual. But it's not that far from the U table. I found it after class last time. Um, okay, gamma P, gamma R, and if we're in this zone, what do we call it? Who remembers? Yeah. Compact. Compact. So what do they call this? Non-compact. Non and how about the one on the end? Slender. Hey, let's do the same thing over here. Guess what? It's everything is the same. Everything's the same. The chart looks the same. We're still going to have phi and then up here. We're still going to have a gamma. But it's, is it gamma the flange? Gamma the web. Now you're going to use an H over, this is H over T sub W. That's what you're going to use for that. But you're still going to have the three zones. You're still going to have a gamma P. You're still going to have a gamma R. Please realize, this is really important. Pay attention, please. These gamma P is not the same as that gamma P. They're not the same. One is for a web, and one is for a flange. Same thing here. Gamma R, they're called the same. I really wish they wouldn't, but they do. They're called the same, but one is for the web, and one is for the flange. Okay? Okay. So there's a table in your book that tells you what these values are, these limits are for your cross-section. We talked about the gamma flange was. We talked about the gamma web was at least for um, a W shape, and that's what we're going to be ta mainly talking about. And they're similar for other, for other sections, if you understand what, what they're getting at. They're, they're, they're very similar for other sections. And what we're going to find out is that we're dealing with three snail charts now, and that we're going to have situations where on one snail chart, we may have the potential, potential to be up here. In another snail chart, we may have the potential to be here because of the slenderness ratio. And then on the third one, we may have the potential to be down here. Which one controls? The lowest moment does, right? The lowest moment is going to end up controlling. So when I draw, when I draw, and I talk about case one, this is real important, talk about case one, I talk about we reach our moment capacity before we ever get to M sub R. I am talking about some scenario where one of those control. Doesn't mean all of them control. Doesn't mean two of them control. It means at least one control. So are you with me on that? That is really important. I'm saying we don't reach our potential 
Why? It could be because the girder's too long. It could be because the top flange is too slender. And it could be because the web is too slender. It could all be three together. It could be one or two. At least we know at least one of them is controlling. Does that make sense? Yay. That is good. Now, when we talk about case two, and it's tough to teach these things really, I think it's still best to introduce this concept first, but I think on the review day we can hopefully lock this away. When we talk about case two and three. Case two, what it really means is again, in, 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 in one of these zones, I am here. One of them, could be all three, could be two, could be one, at least one of them, I am here. Does that make sense? <clears throat> and then case three can sometimes happen when, again, I, I reach this high value, but then, I mean, case two and three are pretty much the same. They're just kind of like vary. This is kind of like the upper bound. This is kind of like the lower bound. Somewhere in the middle. Okay? Where one of these, they're, they're not allowing us to reach case four. Is everybody with me on that? So these graphs are intertwined, extremely intertwined. They're, they're saying the same thing, just from two different ways. This graph is really trying to get at, to get plastic hinge formation, we have to have only have case four. That's all we can have, okay? And then in case two and three helps explain what's going on when, when you're at this zone inside the snail chart. Case one explains when you're in this zone in the snail chart. Any one of them could ruin your day, right? Right. Great. That's what that's all about. We reviewed that. What's local flange buckling? We had a great description of what that looks like earlier. Local web buckling, what that, what's that going to look like? What's that? Yeah, it does. It looks like it, it, the flange is typically straight, typically, for only talking about problems with local web buckling. The web is just too slender, and the web locally kicks out and then is straight. Looks almost exactly like that. Okay. Okay, that's what local web buckling looks like. Now we understand what they are, what all three of them are. I, then I, this is a good question. Are these... Are our local flange and local web buckling a big deal for rolled sections? No. The answer is no. And this is one, ta one reason why I don't choose to talk a lot about this in the undergraduate class. If it's not that big of a deal, then, then, then why talk, talk much about it? Now, how about plate girders? Yeah, this is now going to become what rules the day for us. Okay. This is what's, what we have to realize then when we're designing a plate girder. We're not just dealing with one snail chart. We're dealing with three snail charts. Actually, four snail charts are, are going to be what, what, what we have to deal with. Okay, and I haven't introduced. There's one more. There's one more that has to do with the web. Okay, has to do with the web and shear. Okay, there'll be a snail chart for shear as well coming up. We have to deal with all four of those snail charts. And that is our roadmap when it comes to plate girder design. Okay? You have to understand the roadmap, and that's why I explain it now. Now, because it's not a big deal for rolled sections, and what, what do I mean it's not a big deal? Well, for local web buckling, every single thing is compact. Every one of them is compact. Why is that? Well, it just has to do with the rolling process. When you roll these shapes, the sizes you need for them to support themselves when they're still molten is such that, and survive the rolling process, is such that, that you need a pretty stiff web. Okay? Okay? And because of that, that throws you every, every one of them is thrown down here. And then I said for local flange buckling, I said there were six, the dirty six, right? Half dozen, right? The dirty half dozen. That causes some issues, but they don't really cause us issues. Why, why is that? Why are they not that, much, that, that, that big of a deal? Well, that's not true. We can still use them. But what's the reduction in strength? I mean, this is a, redu a reduction in strength, right? There's a reduction in strength, but how much is it? 
It's less than 5%. It's less than 5%. Okay? The manual calls out the, the dirty half dozen, right? And, but they're all less than 5%. So for those five, for those six, we don't get to case four. Okay, so that's a big deal. We need, we need to use those sections for, for inelastic analysis. That is a big deal. But the loss of capacity is just nothing. Okay? So I'd have to spend two lectures or so at the undergraduate level to get people to really understand this. And all of that for less than 5%? Ugh. Too many other good things to learn. Just too many other good things to learn in life. Okay? Okay. Hey, what's lateral torsional buckling? What is that all about? Too much compression in the top flange. So what's it do? That's right. Showed this picture right here. Talked about this last time. You get too much compression in the top flange. This little zone says, I am not happy and I would rather move to the side, thank you. Gets un, unhappy and tries to kick out. Um, the web says, hey, we're still connected. So it actually twists and moves to the side. Three-dimensionally, this is what it looks like. And we actually did a physical prop, and we'll do that again right now. Structure camera, down the lane I come. Thank you. Here is the beam. You, as you load the beam, the top actually moves and the bottom stays straight. We'll do that again. The top actually moves and the bottom stays straight. Wow. Spectacular. Wow. Cool. Okay, then we're talking about um, doing plastic hinge formation. And we were, Evan, why don't, you, why don't you come be my load for me? This is the one we were doing in class. Well, let's pick one a little bit larger. Okay, and this is what we were doing in class. And this is where I want you to take your calibrated finger and I want you to put, poke about right here. And you have to not push too hard too fast. Okay, because what I want to show everybody is that the first plastic hinge is going to form at the wall. The second plastic hinge should form at the other wall. And the final plastic hinge should happen here. And once it does, we have a mechanism, right? Right. So we're holding right here. We're pushing. We're pushing. Oh my gosh! Hinge, hinge. Keep going. Hinge. Didn't quite go as planned. But we can say we start out with something straight. We don't have something straight anymore. Let's try it again. I actually did the math, actually, to check. And the math set does say that it should happen here. But maybe I'm just not holding it tight enough over here. Let's try it again. Okay? Boom, boom. Oh, that happened that time. Perfect. Boom. So we got a hinge, a hinge, a hinge in the center. One more time. One more time for cyberspace. Let's try it on. Ooh, a long one. Okay, this time I need, I need you to load even slower. Even slower. Okay? So we're loading. Okay, okay. Slow. Slow, slow, oh, that's cool, keep going, slow, okay, and I need you to lift your elbow up, so you're coming straight down with your arm, oh, that's perfect, look at that, you're amazing, load. okay, oh, oh, hinge on the right, oh, look at the right, it's hinged, keep going, keep going, hinge at the left, oh my gosh, look, it's hinged, keep going, keep going, Oh, and it failed. That was amazing. That was the best ever. Let's give a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, quit hitting the button. I'm coming back. See you. Just to warn you. <laughs> that was really cool. Do you believe me now? Yes. Oh, that's good. Sometimes you just have to show people, right? That you're not lying to them, right?
So we showed the lateral torsional buckling. We showed the plastic hinges. I hope everyone in cyberspace saw that Fevin this last time it was especially amazing. It was amazing. We were loading. Her load was here. Her finger was here. This is just like the example problem we had. We got our first hinge to happen here, right? We got our second hinge to happen over here. And how did I know there was a hinge? Because there was a bend, right? There was a bend in it. We kept loading, we kept loading, and we got our third hinge, and it was like a snap, right? When it went right through. Actually, it was pretty deflected, okay? And then we saw this, boom, then it kicked over, and that was the deflected shape, right? That was it. At any point, if she would have unloaded, we would still would have had a hinge here, still would have had, well, actually, the hinge would have tried to go back, depending on how damaged it was, okay? You may have had some permanent deformation, but the majority of this elastic deformation would have come back, okay? Very cool, very cool. Okay, this is a um, review for a lot of people. I just throw it in here. Um, I, I, this is the same Snell chart we've been drawing over and over and over again. I give you the equation for um, L sub P, or what happens if you're in the different zones. This is the plastic hinge. This was the what? Zone two was what? Inelastic lateral torsional buckling. Zone three is our favorite lateral torsion buckling, the one with the big nasty equation. Okay, um, sometimes, sometimes, not often, but sometimes what people do is when they're solving for big nasty equations like this, they assume this term is zero. Why? Because it's conservative and it makes the math a hell of a lot easier to do. Okay? You may have to do that coming up, okay? Assume this term is zero, solve and see if it's conservative. If you want to iterate, you, you can. If you want to write a spreadsheet, you can. It's extremely common to get a first guess to just assume that term right there is zero. Okay, this gives you all the variables. Here's the L sub P equation. Here's the L sub R equation. And the cool thing is, is all of this is already calculated for every rolled section in your manual, and we'll talk about that coming up in the Z tables, right? The Z tables. And then there's actually a bunch of snail charts all over the place, already in your manual, whole bunch of them on top of one another, where they've plotted hundreds of these snail charts together, cut them up in little pieces, and then put those little pieces inside the manual. That's coming up for us to talk about as well. But one thing that's real important to talk about before we get there, um, really, really important, I can't remember the organ. Oh, yeah, I remember now the order I, I, I present them in. There's two major things that we're going to talk about that are assumptions that are made at the undergraduate level that we're going to realize at the graduate level are not always right. Okay? Not always right. And the first one is L sub B. And what is it? It's the unbraced length of the beam. The other way to say it is it's the length between the braces, right? The length between the braces. We're going to learn today that not all braces are created equal. Okay? Not all braces are, are, are created equal. Okay? Um, and then we're going to learn another thing about C sub B. Now, it just so happens that every single time, well, when, when, when these equations were derived, and the differential equations work out a whole lot easier, because this, this is a big differential equation you have to solve for lateral torsional buckling, okay? Um, and and when, you, when you work out the differential equation for lateral torsional buckling, it just so happens it's, very, it's much easier to solve if you have a constant moment on your cross-section. A constant moment on your cross-section. So how often does that happen in life, with constant moments in your cross-section? Not that often. The only thing, time I can ever think of is if you have a, a dual point load. Okay? Some kind of dual point load. In between those dual point loads, you will have a constant if, if they're the same. If they're P and P. doesn't matter where they're at. You will have a constant moment in between those two. That's about the only circumstance I can ever think of. And even if you think of real life, what are the odds that these two will truly be loaded equally? Pretty low, don't you think? Pretty low. 
So there may be some slight moment diagram, but what, what we need to get out of this is that all this was derived, this perfect thing is derived, and actually when we did our little, our little physical models here, and I have my hands at the side, I grab them like this and I twist, so I put a constant moment on it. Okay? See how that works. Meep. Meep. Twist, right? Right. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Constant moment. It's too bad in life we don't always have constant moments. But that's where the C sub B factor comes in. And we're going to talk about the C sub B factor coming up. And we only had one C sub B factor we dealt with as undergrads. Oh, life was so easy. We'll find that there's actually three in grad school we have to deal with. And two of them are extremely important because if you don't do it right, you can kill people. Okay? And they happen all the time. And you may ask yourself, why are these not in the manual? And I don't have a good answer for that. Okay? Okay. Let's go to a new set of notes. Bong. Bong. Okay, so lateral support for beams or bracing. We've shown that as a beam gets longer, that the failure mode changes from plastic hinge formation to one of lateral instability. And we're really just talking about lateral torsional buckling because bracing does not help you for local buckling. I'll say that again. Bracing does not help you for local buckling. Let's say you do have a local buckling problem. What can you do? Stiffeners. Stiffeners can help you. Stiffen section. We'll be talking about those coming up. Okay? Yes. Stiffeners are the answer. Now it depends on how closely they're spaced, right? Now if you don't want to use a stiffener, what else can you do? You can make things thicker, right? Make things thicker. Okay. But we're talking about bracing for lateral torsional buckling. Ugh. So bright. Okay, so instead of making all our beams short, one can increase the capacity by providing a, great, a brace. Hey, I've got a beam, I've got a moment, the beam wants to kick out here. If I take something and hold it back, force it to go back, what's it gonna do? It's gonna change its mode shape. This would be like a first mode type failure. Right? If you remember that from buckling analysis, this is a second mode type failure. Okay, we change the unbraced length. You could think of these as now two different L sub Bs, or L sub B over two, right? Or L sub B, whatever whatever this L sub B is, because the brace doesn't have to be in the center. Brace can be anywhere. It's going to be. This could be. This is now one beam you would look at. This is now another beam you could look at, and you would expect the second moment to be greater than the first moment. Is everybody with me? Oh, beautiful, for gracious guys. If brace is placed at the middle, then one can force a second mode of buckling. Here's the top flange. There's it with the, with the brace there. It looks something like that. It takes a larger moment to get the second case to occur, and the capacity is increased because LB sub 2 is less than LB sub 1. If you're still kind of confused or whatever about this, go back to our beautiful snail chart we showed previously as your unbraced length goes down, your capacity goes up. You with me? Yay! However, all braces are not created equal. Ugh, I wish they were, but they're not. They're not. So when we talk about effectiveness of a brace, then two criteria are important. I don't expect you to understand this the first time I say it. I expect you though, by the end of the page, to have this concept totally locked in and mastered, hoping, fingers crossed, right? 
two criteria are important. The ability to resist lateral movement of the cross section. That's criteria number one. Criteria number two is ability to resist twist of the cross section. What? I know the first time I heard this, these two concepts, I could read the words, but I didn't quite get the concept. And that's why I came up with some of these physical props that we're going to talk about. But think about, the, the key here is think about the buckled shape and stop movement. Think about the buckled shape and stop movement. And that will get us through a lot of the time. But sadly, not all of the time. Okay? Okay, so I'll tell you what. I'm going to try to do this whole prop showing session up here. And I'm hopefully, hopefully between the video and your eyes looking, you'll get everything. If you don't get something, we can always come walk around, all right? Okay? Okay. Great. So, David, I want you to come up and help me. Okay? And we're going to start out with a beam. And we're going to imagine we're taking a simply supported beam, and I'll give you all these notes, okay? But we're going to imagine we're going to start out with a simply supported beam, and this isn't a simply supported beam, but it's good enough. I mean, it's not a, a, a eye-shaped, eye it's a rectangular-shaped, but it's good enough. It's good enough. And we're going to talk about what's going to, what's going to look like before, load, before loading, and then I'm going to draw a cross-section of what it looks like after the loading, all right? after the loading. And then we're going to write out what is the L sub B. Notice that it's L long. You're with me? Okay. So if I have no braces on my girder and I grab it, let's zoom out here, see if we can get this in here. I can do it at a, at a diagonal. If I have no braces along my length, no braces, and I put the moment on it, what's going to happen? What, what's the cross section going to look like at the middle? going to go, it's just going to move and look like that at the middle. Let's prove it. The dead center, point to the center for me. At the dead center, right there, move to the side. That's all it did, is move to the side. You with me? Yes? What's else to be? What's else to be? L. Man, you guys are smart. Okay, so now I'm going to take and I'm going to brace it. So you're going to use your fingers and very lightly you're going to put it on the bottom. Don't squeeze it. Put it on the bottom down here, the very center, okay? Good. So, well, before he does it, what do you think is going to happen? Gonna be the same? It's gonna be different. The brace is there, there's a brace now at the center. I think it's gonna be a little different. The bottom flange will actually be more straight as opposed to tilted or diagonal. Okay, let's try it. Grab the bottom. Oh, it's still buckled, didn't it? Bottom flange is about the same, right? Maybe a little straighter. Maybe a little straighter, but I'm going to say it looks the same. You, you agree? You saw it. Yeah. You're the closest. Looks the same. What's else to be? No. L. L. Why would you say it's L over 2? Well, you would think it's the link between the braces, right? But it's the link between the effective braces. Did the deflected shape change from this case to this case? So should the L change? No. It's the same, isn't it? Right? It's the same. Okay, so, so Miles, you're exactly right. The deflected shape's a little bit different. The capacity may be a little bit higher but we're talking about 5% higher. Not enough to worry about, and 
you don't want to work a five pitch differential equation for five percent, buddy. Let me tell you, it's not worth it. You've got better things to do in your life. Okay, so now we're going to put a brace in the middle. What do you think is going to happen? What's that? More support. Okay. What's the deflected shape going to look like? Think it'll be straight? I don't know. Let's do the test. Okay, so now you have to be, ideally you would be both fingers, like that, ideally. Oh, I like that even better. <laughs> Loosey goosey. What happened? So you you're the closest, right? Mm -hmm. Is it still buckling? Yes. Is the deflected shape largely similar to what it was in the past? Yeah. The deflected shape. Just looks like that, doesn't it? From the center. So what's L to B? L. Now what was the rules again? What are the two criteria we're trying to do every time? This is where you look at the top of your page, you reread it, you relearn. Saturation is the key. And lateral movement because we could say this one didn't resist any lateral movement at all, did it? Because which zone's in compression? The top. Which one wants to buckle? The top. So now this was a little better. We, we noticed there was a change in the deflected shape, but it still didn't stop it from buckling. Maybe from 5% we got up to maybe 10% increase in capacity. Maybe. Only I truly know because it was my fingers doing the moments, right? Didn't really help us all the way, did it? Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen now? <laughs> Jennifer's convinced nothing ever works. <laughs> Bracing is mythical and made up. What do you think? It's not like we're wagering, okay? I think it'll be the best out of all of It's going to be the best, Dan says. Oh, I forgot to draw my I'm deflected shape down done. here. Of the best of the ones we've done. So let's do it. You're going to take your, your fingers again, do, do them on, on, on the top. Oh! Your Texas ring is too big. <laughs> Damn oh, Aggies, God. right? <laughs> Oh, what do we get? Mode two. We got bracing. Hallelujah, right? It works. It works. It works. It works. We'll say at the center. Remember, we're talking about the cross section at the center. It looks the same. It looks the same. It looks the same. What do we have for LB? Over two. L over 2. Oh, we're feeling good about ourselves, right? <laughs> what if we deal with a girder that's deep? That girder was short, wasn't it? Yes, short. What if we, girder, we deal with a girder that's twice as deep, more than twice as deep? Do you think it's going to change anything? Some people are saying no, some people are, have taken my classes before, and they're thinking yes, let's try it, what do you say? Let's try it. Let's try it. We're going to do the same thing. We're going to move it here to the center. Thank you, Brace. 
Loading. Ah, uh, loading. What's going on? Something really strange is happening. Yeah. What's going on? The bottom kicked out? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, I'm not lying to you. What happened? Well, we had our top... Whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't draw it deep enough. We draw another one. Where we put a brace at the top. And I start loading it. What actually happens is the bottom kicks out. And this is called side sway web buckling. The bottom kicks out. You saw it. It it's happened. True. It's true. So what L do I use? L. L. Now please realize that if, if we were so inclined, we could do the five page differential equation and we could actually figure out what percentage, because it's not truly L, right? It's a little less than L, okay? I don't, I'm not, that doesn't excite me, okay? To go and do the math, okay? Actually, I've got to find an element program that, that'll do this, and I should, probably should do the actual numbers, okay, for you. But for design purposes, we would use L. You'd say, what? What is going on here? When something was short, and what's short in real life when things are less than 12 inches or so? Then a brace at the top was effective. When the depth gets larger than 12 inches, we're starting to get this scenario where a brace at the top is not enough. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This is exciting. This is so cool. Okay, so now we're going to brace the top and the bottom. Two hands, right, at once. We'll start out with a small beam. What do you think is going to happen? Think it's going to work? Think the brace is going to work? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's try it. Top and bottom. I go, and oh my gosh, second mode. You can see it. Second mode, right? Yes? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. There's no deflection. What's our L? What's going to happen if it's deep? What do you think? Is it going to work? What do you think? Some people are saying yes. You ready? Let's try it. Some people just don't want to say anything. Second mode. It works. Web can't kick out. What is going on? Yes, it always works regardless of the depth. Let's go back and read what was important. Two criteria. I told you. I told you we'd say these things in words and you'd read them and you'd hear them, but you really wouldn't get it until we show you how it works. Ability to resist the lateral movement of the cross section. That has to be taken care of. Check. And then, the ability to resist the twist of the cross-section. This ability to resist twist is extremely important in deep members. In deep members. In shallow members, not as much important. However, if you're designing a brace and you want to ensure that it is a true brace, then you have to stop movement at the top flange and the bottom flange together. Okay. How about this one? I've got a beam with a brace at the top and a stiffener in it. I go and I load it up. 
What do you think the fucking shape's gonna look like? For a short one. Does the E stiffener does anything? So don't you think it's probably going to look pretty similar to this one? Don't you think? Okay. We can do that real quick. So you're going to, you're going to brace at the top, and then you're going to take your finger and put it on the side. You're talented, so I know you can do this. Two, second mode. Right? Okay. That's right. What's our L? L over 2. Oh. How about our big boy? Is it going to work? What's, what's, what do you think the L is going to be? For a deep girder. What do you think? I hear a vote for... I hear a vote for L over 2. Let's try it. What do you say? Let's do it. Got the top. Got a finger on it. And it's L. It's, it's not kicking out. It worked. What? How did that happen? I'm telling you. Without a stiffener, what happened? The web kicked out. With a stiffener, what happened? The web didn't kick out. Why? What do you think? The stiffener provided resistance for that for the web to buckle. That's right. The stiffener provided the enough stiffness, localized stiffness to keep the web from buckling. To keep the web from actually kicking out to the side. So, we should also talk, probably talk about why this happens. But, um, but when this thing gets deep, same thing happens. Get the brace here. We get the brace here. We get L over 2. I'm sorry, no brace at the bottom. L over 2. We get the second mode. All is right and good with the world if you add a stiffener. Not so much here. What happens with just a stiffener? Take that one case. What do you think? I don't know. We're going to do that one. Let's do it. <laughs> it's just a stiffener. So you, your finger has to rotate as this rotates. Okay. No good? Nothing. Why did the stiffener not work by itself? Didn't do anything, really. Yeah. It was worthless, right? It didn't resist this lateral movement, is the big one. Stiffener by itself. But if you had a stiffener and a brace, you're good. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. Um, you mean if it's by you mean if it's resistance if it's a stiffener like this? Um, yeah, it does, um, and it can be just as effective as this stiffener if it's in the right location. Um, longitudinal stiffeners are not done very often anymore. Almost really, really rarely are they used. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you, David. Pause so you can write them down. <laughs>